listeners, welcome to the 10 Pieces of 8 podcast. I'm Michael, and we have a special guest, well, not even a guest, a co-host with us today, Mr. Jack Shepherdson. <laughs> Michael, good morning. How are we going? Great. How are you going? <laughs> very well, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, start co-hosting this with you. It's very exciting. Oh, it absolutely is. Now, for our listeners, let's get to know you a little bit. Who are you? What do you do? <laughs> Who are you? Who are you? <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> Who do you think you are? Um, yeah, I'll give you a little bit of background, no dramas. Yeah. Um, so, as yes, as you mentioned, my name's Jack Shepherdson. Um, I am a watch and car holic. I think it's probably <laughs> the the best way to put it. Um, I, I have other interests. I, I think um, in terms of of you know what we're going to be discussing on this, um, yeah. my, my interests specifically lie around vintage watches, uh, mm. classic cars, vintage racing. Um, modern stuff as well, because I, I love modern cars, modern watches. I've yeah. got a handful, wear them all the time. Um, but vintage, I think, is where my, my, my heart lies. Um, yeah. my inter- I've, I have interests outside of this. As, as I think, as we all do, you can't be just watches and cars. No. You can, but it's going to be a <laughs> scary existence. That's, I can see the Hieronymus Bosch painting of just those two topics, and that's a little scary. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I, I love uh, it really every, everything that, that encompasses design um, in interests me, be it architecture, industrial design, yeah. furniture, um, photography. I, I, I love photography and, and, and shoot a ton. Um, art, really anything that, that that falls into these categories, it's all c- connected by design. Is, is the is is the connecting sinew between a lot of the things that I'm I'm interested in and, and love. Um, but yeah, definitely, uh, definitely watches and, and cars and racing is is a is a is a huge part of that. Yeah, well, then we're very happy to have you on because we are talking about cars, watches, Formula One, all the good stuff this weekend. Let's take a look at what do you got on because I noticed you got some very something very interesting on your wrist right now. This is uh, yeah not something you'll see every day. Um, actually, not a watch I've ever seen in person. Apart from this, uh, what I've got is a Boulevard Accutron Space View. I'll uh, for for the people just listening, not watching what the what you're hearing is me <laughs> passing the watch <laughs> over. over the watch. <laughs> um, so uh, this is a really interesting piece. Ooh, should I give you the history on it or? Um, yeah, sure. Go for it. It's a very interesting watch. It, it looks like it has circuits for our audio listeners in the dial. I don't, I'm not sure if they are circuits, but it certainly looks a bit like one. Yeah. So um, th- this one does have a little bit of a, a story. So so forgive me for <laughs> for, um, uh, for for not. I won't go too deep into it, but yeah. to give you the four one one. Um, basically, after World War Two, uh, mm-hmm. Bolivar had all of this this money um, they'd made through uh, through the war effort supplying uh, watches for servicemen uh, dials for planes anything that was around the watch space or, or timekeeping they were they were one of the major suppliers especially yeah. for the Americans mm-hmm. um, and instead of just uh, pocketing it they put it straight back into R&D yeah. they ended up trying to develop effectively the the first uh, one of the first electronic watches um, they weren't to uh, they weren't the first which was the Hamilton mm-hmm. um, which Elvis famously wore um, but what we're, this is a, an accurate this is the first tuning fork watch ever made. Oh, cool. So essentially, there's a tiny little tuning fork in this which oscillates, and I believe it's around 22,000 beats per second, and that's what is keeping time. So the second hand is the smoothest, smoother than a spring drive, mm-hmm. smoother, much, much smoother than what you'll have in terms of the, the five ticks, average five ticks of a mechanical watch. Yeah. They run for battery. They aren't quartz. There's no quartz technology in this. This is, uh, I think, 1960. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure someone will call the me on that. Will. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but this is this is uh, way before quartz, which was 1969. Quartz ended up killing these movements, um, pretty much dead at that point. Um, yeah. But before that, these were used because these were so accurate, much more accurate than anything that mechanical watches had yeah. ever come close to. Um, they'll still wipe the floor with a mechanical watch if these are tuned and kept in, in yeah. good running well, order. Mechanical which watches is, have never been great. They've never been great. Time. <laughs> Never been great. Um, these were used on everything from Air Force One to the president's desk. Um, they're American watches, so yeah. they're Swiss made, but from American companies. So yeah. there's a lot of history there, and the Americans were quite proud of Bulova at the time. Still are, of course. Um, these even made it into the timing modules on all of the Apollo landers. So these right. movements went to space. And there's a few still sitting up on the moon, um, which is a really cool thing. And they make quite a humming noise. So if you put that to your ear, I'll put it up to the mic. If yeah. uh, Let me know if we can, if the, you can pick this up. Sure. A little bit closer. A little bit. Yeah, a, yeah, a bit of ASMR. So much I've, ASMR, I've, I've guys. B- bopped it into the mic. Yeah. Um, anyway. <laughs> but if you put it to your ear, you'll you'll absolutely be able to hear it hum. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is a hum. It's not a tick. No, it's a hum. It, yeah. It's, it's 22,000 oscillations a second. Yeah. Um, so uh, anyway, lo lo long, long story long, um, Bulldog <laughs> put these movements out. And uh, in order to show the, the public why they were spending, you know, quite a significant margin, um, mm. multiples of, of, over a mechanical watch yeah. um, from any brand, they took, they sent them into, they, they sent uh, retailers one of these watches without a dial because they were all sold with dials. Definitely. And all of the people who saw it went, I want that one <laughs> without the dial. I want to see all the mechanics in it. Um, so uh, they they did what, they, you know, customers always write. Yeah. And then we got the Space View, which is the uh, Accutron without a dial, cool. effectively. It's like um, a skeleton, skeletonized dial without, before skeletonizing was the thing. <laughs> way, way before skeletonizing. Um, this, you know, ended up on the wrist of a uh, famous architect, Richard Rogers, and the colors and sort of, all of the elementary colors you see in this and the the fact that it's uh you know it's wearing its internals on the outside inspired the yeah. center pompidou in in, in paris which cool. is a building with a uh, very famous building with with lots of you know elementary colors and all of the pipes on the lots outside of, of the building so you can see the inspiration from this okay long story long long story long <laughs> well uh my watch does not have such a storied history <laughs> my watch is a seiko land tortoise um, which low key I got for half price at a Michael Hill jeweler because I really liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely can't complain. <laughs> so that's what I've got. But let's talk about a watch that actually has people talking and has a, has a bit of a story behind it. More than just you and I. No one else is talking about Accutrons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. The Hublot Not For Resale Hodinkee Edition. Is that what? Is that the full title? I'm not even really sure. That's a, I, I, that's a good question. I think it's uh, probably going to be, what, Hublot Classic Fusion... Hodinkee edition, yeah. edition Hodinkee, cross Hodinkee. I know, I know not for resale is in there somewhere in quotes, whether it's in the middle at the end, you never know. <laughs> never know, that's for sure. But could you could you explain what this watch is and where it comes from? Because it's it actually has a very unique story of like how it came to be, really. It does, yeah. I mean, this this is a watch with with a little bit of baggage, um, which I think is is worth explaining. That's for sure. Um, in 2012, uh, Hublot, you know, being quite a, a brand that's that's known as a bit of a rule breaker, they're quite contentious uh, in the watch community. Some people love least. them. Yeah, that's for sure. Some people love them. Some people hate them. Nico Leonard. We won't. <laughs> we won't. We won't go there. Not that. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and and being being a being a rule breaker, being a little bit different, they did something that no other watchmaker um, before, or I believe even since, has, has done. Mm -hmm. it takes inspiration from the car world. When you take your car in for a service, you're given a loaner car. Understandable. Loaner watches. Why not? Makes sense. So when you take your Hublot in for service to one of the Hublot ateliers, mm -hmm. I believe it's only just with with the specialist um, service centres, they'll yeah. supply you with a loaner watch, which was a plastic version of the classic Hublot Fusion watch. Yeah. Black plastic, black dial, quartz movement, which is something that no one else has done. Yeah. Bit of bit of um, Speedmaster holding. Uh, sorry, this, I'll start that one again. Okay. Um, a bit of Speedmaster swatch. You know, prototype oh, watch style. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Similar, it's a similar, similar um, aesthetic. That's for sure. A similar um, approach to it. Yeah, with the quartz movement, cheaper, cheaper materials, but yep. you still got that iconic design. Yeah, still. Whether, whether you like the classic fusion or not, it's an iconic design. It's they named yep. the whole brand Hublot from Porthole. <laughs> yeah, exactly from Porthole. Yeah, exactly right. Um, so yeah, you were supplied with this uh, this black uh, plastic uh, fusion, mm -hmm. which was a loaner watch whilst your watch was away on on repair, and then when it comes back, you do the swap, give them the, uh, the loaner watch back, and yeah. you get yours. What's really cool about these, though, is it has written just above 6 o'clock, not for sale. And hence, you're starting to pick up maybe where the not for resale part comes into it <laughs> yeah. in the Hodinkee version. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, very, very cool watch. Um, whether or not the not for sale was uh, to tell clients, customers that – you can't buy this. It's off catalog. Yeah. This is not a watch that you'll find on the Hublot website or in a catalog. This is complete unobtainium. You can't buy them from Hublot. No one's ever been able to buy them. Maybe this was to tell clients that they couldn't buy these. Maybe this was to tell dealers that if someone took their Hublot into, you know, a, a pawn shop and yeah. just said, well, give me some money for it, that it says not for sale, yeah. saying, you know, put your hands up and, and walk away. Yeah. Maybe, who knows? Maybe. Who, who knows for sure? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, a few of these got out onto the market, um, as, as always happens. Um, they're 
and people were, you know, not finding these in catalogs, confused at where yeah. they came from. The story, you know, in whispers here and there came about. And uh, stuff of legend. <laughs> stuff of legend, yeah. Um, as often happens in the watch world. And out of that, uh, now Hodinki have decided to riff on it and produced a new limited edition, limited to 100 pieces. Mm-hmm. Already sold out, mind you. <laughs> Already sold out. Um, 100 piece limited edition of the Hublot Classic Fusion, um, this time in titanium, a material that Hublot is, is famous for using and, and mm-hmm. loves to use. Makes sense with them. The, the art of fusion is their, is their tagline and their, their ethos. Yeah. So titanium is the perfect, uh, perfect material for this. Yeah. Taupe grey dial and strap. Yeah, because like the original, that's it's black. It's black plastic, and it. Th- I'm just su- I'm just surprised that it, this is titanium and it's gr- well, not so much that it's grey because they can make what, what col- whatever color they want. Grey is very hodinky, like in terms of their branding. But I'm just surprised that they upped it to titanium because that's pretty robust compared to plastic, and it's not like this was like ceramic or anything like that. Yeah, titanium is an interesting choice, um, and it, it, I think it looks fantastic. Um, it's it's uh, it's not a watch I've ever really considered before. Um, owning myself, but it's uh, it's one I, I could absolutely see on my wrist. Um, but anyway, we should probably, I'll finish the, the story of, of where the <laughs> where the, uh, the the resale comes in. So um, at six o'clock, just like on the uh, the original, saying mm. not for sale, now we have new text in white saying not for resale, mm. re, the re being in parentheses, yeah. which is a little bit of a dig at the, uh, the watch industry's, you know, habit of flipping and you know, that sort of, I guess, dirty under the table side of the, the community that <laughs> happens time to time, a necessary evil. Um, so it's a little bit of a, of, a, of a dig at that, but it's also, mm. an, I guess, a homage or playing off of the, the not for sale Hublot. Yeah. Is it, it would, did they make it actually in partnership with Hublot or is it just something that they did on their own with a few classic fusions? Do you know? No, this is 100% uh, official. This okay. is an official collaboration oh, okay. so you between didn't... Hodinkee and Hublot. Oh, see there, I didn't even know that. I know I saw a lot of people when I, mean, I was just looking up at this watch and stuff, and there's just a few people complaining about Hodinki releases and and this one specifically. But you know, it seems like a lot of the complaints, were, at least with this watch, is the sort of the complaints that go with Hublots in general. You know, the movement, you know, the price tag and all that sort of stuff. But do you do you feel like it's warranted in this case? Well, I think it's kind of a perfect storm to 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 ha- to hang hang complaints off of this watch um everyone can complain about hublot whether or not you like them or not mm. you're going to be able to complain about them um hodinkee as well you know they're uh they're they're, they're a, 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 i think they're a fantastic um uh, aspect to the community um but again you can definitely um put some complaints on them um for things they've done yeah. in the past some special editions um we do get quite a few special editions a year from from hodinkee i think it's mm. probably one every two three months give or take at the moment from what's what's Hublot's uh, rate of limited editions in a year, though? I think probably a few more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> probably a few more. Um, the, the Hodinkee editions, you know, there, there's the running joke where all they do is kill the date, mm-hmm. where, you know, the Nomos as they've done in the past and some of the Hoyas they've done, it's always just kill the date, take the date off, off the watch. In this case, we do still have the date, which the original didn't have as well, which is an interesting thing to see. So there's actually improvements, well, depending on how you feel about date windows. Yeah. I know some people... Joe, actually, <laughs> he ac- absolutely cannot stand date windows on dive watches. I know this isn't quite a dive watch, but it kind of is. It's a sports, wa- sports it's watch. It's a sports watch. Yeah, yeah. definitely a sports watch. Um, I, I have no issue with the date. Um, so uh, it's it's definitely not Hodinkee just doing the same tried and true formula every yeah. time. It is changing. Yeah. The colors, I think, great. Um, it's a very Hodinkee color. It really does play into 100%. the you know um, young New York resident sort of mm-hmm. vibe that they that they that they play with. Mm. With the color, um, so it's it's definitely on brand for them. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, I think it's a really interesting special edition. It's one of their first special editions that I can think of, maybe apart from the Hoyer Skipper from a few years ago, which we've just seen a reissue, um, uh, an the, official reissue from Tag. I not to get on too off topic, but I love the reissue of the Skipper. It's fantastic. Yeah, I think it might even be better than original. That's my hot take. I don't know if it, I don't know if it is yeah. a hot take, but that's my hot take. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's 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 one of the the only other ones I can think of where mm. there's a story associated with yeah. with this this Hodinkee edition, as opposed to just them doing a riff on a on an existing brand, yeah, or existing no, watch. I think I think it's actually clever to make these available, but not too available to to the general public. Because how much of the the not for sales, the the black quartz versions, how much were they? going for on the secondary market do you know that's a good question i've never seen any cross the block yeah okay. um i don't think they go to auction because it's technically not a watch you're allowed to 
own. Technically illegal if they're loner watches, you're selling something that doesn't belong to you. Yeah, I, I maybe the, the 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 situation was, do you sacrifice your Hublot when you take it in for service, mm. knowing that you're going to take away the loner watch and it's going to be worth more than the watch you t- took in? Was is that people's perspective, or do they w- would it that. still technically be their property? So it's a little murky on this one. Um, I, I've never seen any come up for sale. I'm sure they do. They do change hands. Yeah. Some that have got out into uh, into collectors' hands. Mm. Whether or not that would be public is another story. I would. I doubt it. I doubt it. It would be a bit like someone coming up with, you know, the Buzz Aldrin um, Speedmaster, publicly oh. for sale. It's still technically NASA property. So no, oh, so yeah. no one is going to be bringing that to the public market, knowing that Men in Black will turn up at the door. Would <laughs> Would Jean Claude Biver turn up at the door and uh, and demand uh, put his hand out and demand that Hublot back if he lists it for sale? I wouldn't put it past him. There you go. <laughs> so um, Hublot is not a brand I've really considered as part of my collection before, um, l- largely due to the fact that they're very valuable watches, and yeah. for the money, there's probably other things I would buy before. Mm. However, this is the first Hublot I've looked at. And gone. Hmm, I could see a place for that in my watch box. I think. See, for me, it's it's. I like the classic fusions generally, but they're they're kind of the only Hublots that I like. And this is essentially like it's got the classic fusion um, case, you know. Um, and I like the size. It's at thirty eight millimeters, so it can actually fit on my wrist. A big part of why I I don't. I don't well, I, I, assuming apart from the part I can't afford Hublot watches, is that the fact that they're massive. And I have itty bitty wrists, <laughs> so they will look comical on me. But yeah, this is nice. I actually prefer the black one, like the actual not for sale one, than the the gray. But I think that's that's just personal preference. I still think it looks looks pretty good. The black looks fantastic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so does so does the gray. Um, mm. It's a cool color. Yeah. Seen it in titanium is a really nice nice thing. Um, yeah. And this one's mechanical, of course. It's 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 automatic. Um, yeah. Which the original was just a, just a quartz. simple quartz. Um, with the red on the second hand as well, it's such a nice little little pop of color. I think it's necessary too. I feel like it would be a little washed out without that. It's just a little bit of red, but I think it adds a lot. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's a it's a cool thing. I mean, limited to a hundred, so mm. we'll see when these start changing hands. Um, yeah, how much on the market? Maybe some will come to Australia. Maybe they haven't. Yeah, because these sold for what seven thousand eight hundred US dollars. Um, seven eight uh, seven seven thousand nine hundred. Seven nine seven nine seven nine. That's for sure. Um, yeah, this is one that I'm hoping to see at a collector's get together one day. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure it'll be like a bit quite sought after. Who knows? Yeah, so. exactly. I mean, with a story like this, any watch that ha- that has a bit of a story you can tell. Immediately. Exactly. It's it's cool at first glance, but if you if you know, you know. Yeah. It's a bit of a, you know, the Masonic behind the back, secret, yeah. the secret handshake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From one nerd to another. Yeah. Speaking of storied watches, the Rolex Daytona for Le Mans, that 100th anniversary... Man, it's a stunning watch. <laughs> this is probably the biggest release of the year from Rolex. And I think yeah. after Watches and Wonders, when we, we saw their 60th anniversary of the Daytona release, mm. it was a little bit underwhelming for some. I, we- didn't, I didn't like it. I, I think I called it uh, a Daytona on weight, that went on Weight Watches. It's <laughs> a good way to put it. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it, it, was a, it was a refinement of the classic Daytona. Yeah. And we saw the same 50th anniversary, the platinum with the, the brown bezel and the ice blue dial, mm. updated to the new... Uh, um, to the new Daytona, which was fine for a 60th, but I think we all kind of knew Rolex had something up their sleeve, and yeah, now we, and now we have it. Yeah, and it's bloody it's bloody great. I don't like the story behind Daytonas more than I actually like Daytonas. I appreciate Daytonas a lot, but I, for my money, I just wouldn't buy one. It's just a preference thing. No, we're full of hot takes today. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll ask you this, Michael: yeah. Have you ever seen a manual wind Daytona in the flesh? Uh, in the I've seen it behind glass. Behind glass. Where did you see it? Um, I think it was at a museum. Fuck, where did I see it? You know what? I'll get back to you on that because I don't remember anymore. <laughs> but it's funny you still remember it. Um, they're, they're, a, they're an interesting watch. I think the problem that I have with a modern Daytona, and this mm. is similar, it's not a watch that I particularly lust after. Yeah. It's a really complicated dial. A lot of lines of text, Very busy. and those subdials with the uh, with the, the the surrounds instead of a solid coloured subdial. Yeah, it's a really busy watch. Very absolutely. So I I agree. They're, they're not the f- for me. It's not perfect, but this gets pretty close. Yeah, yeah. This is really nice. White gold reverse panda dial. I like the little one hundred to mark the anniversary on the tachy uh, tachymeter. Yeah, tachymeter. <laughs> 
on the bezel. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Maybe we should go into the, the history of just explain what this watch is first. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Take it away. <laughs> no, no, if you'd be happy for me, sure. Yeah. Um, what we're looking at this year in, in 2023 is the 100th anniversary of Le Mans, the, yeah. ra- the 24-hour endurance race in France. What a race that was, if you watched it. <laughs> the, the latest? Yeah, the latest oh, Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Ferrari's uh, finally back on top. Back on top. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Don't you worry, guys. We'll get to it. <laughs> Um, so Rolex and the Le Mans race are, are hugely connected. Mm. Um, when the Daytona first came out, this was Rolex uh, in, in 1963. This was Rolex's redesigned chronograph. They've made chronographs in the past mm. and collectors today will refer to those as pre-Daytonas and Jean-Claude Keeleys. And there's lots of collectible variations you'll see throughout mm-hmm. that. But when they came to market in 1963, this was a, a whole redesign of a watch. Yeah. It featured a, uh, a Takimu bezel in, in steel. Reference 6263 was the first one. Mm-hmm. And the early ones, the double Swiss underlines, they were really close to Speedmasters, um, Hoyas of the time, similar racing watches. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of difference between them when you hold them um, in the flesh. Yeah. It's it's the first redesigned Rolex chronograph. And when that first came out, they were calling it the Le Mans. Yeah, I actually, I saw a, an ad from 1964, I believe it was, and it said, this is the new Rolex chronograph. It's called Le Mans. And it was, it's like the only ad that ever ran. It's the only ever suggestion that this was not called the Daytona. And I think, it, was it you who told me that Rolex decided to call it the Daytona instead of the Le Mans because Americans wouldn't be able to pronounce? They would call it like Le Mans. Le Mans, exactly right. <laughs> yeah, they were really struggling with, uh, you know, Fr- French is, uh, has always been a bit tricky for the for the Americans, but oh, man, that's, that's a topic for, for another day. <laughs> <laughs> tricky, yeah, definitely tricky for me. It's uh, <laughs> not one I speak. There's no shade to our American audiences. We get the name change. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't speak it for shit, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely no shade. Um, so when Rolex started sponsoring Daytona, the, the race in America, they started referring to this chronograph as the Daytona. And interestingly, before it was called the Daytona, there was no name on the dial. So mm-hmm. where you'll see Daytona script above the six o'clock subdial yep. on modern Daytonas and some of the vintage ones as well, you won't see Le Mans anywhere on the dial. All it said was Rolex Cosmograph. And C- Cosmograph, by the way, is because they were trying to get the Americans and NASA to issue it as the, or select it as the uh, Space Watch. Space Watch, naturally. That's it, a story for <laughs> Look, another time. We know time. how well that worked out for Omega. They still bring it up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I think Rolex is still a little salty they didn't get it. And it still <laughs> says Cosmograph on the modern ones. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> um, but anyway, b- back, on, back on topic. So this is uh, really a, a love letter to the race to Le Mans, yeah. celebrating both the 60th anniversary of the Daytona, Rolex Daytona, yeah. and oh, 100th anniversary of Le Mans. So that's why we're seeing the red 100 on the tachymeter bezel. Mm. The the, uh, the movement itself has been it's redesigned. Yeah, it's, it's, what is it? It's the 4132 now. Instead of the 4131, which was yeah. still a brand new caliber. Yeah, but this one, the difference is instead of a 12 hour uh, thing on the tachymeter, it's 24. On the subdial. On the sub- yeah. Is it on the subdial or on the tachymeter? Oh, oh. On the subdial. On the subdial, yeah. yeah. So the the nine o'clock subdial. This is why I said I was an idiot before. (laughs) (laughs) Won't hold it against you. Trust me, I'm the idiot savant over here. Um, So, uh, yeah, the nine o'clock subdial, um, instead of totalizing 12 hours, as it does on all other Daytonas, is 24 hours. And being a 24-hour race, this is... The, this is the Rolex chronograph you're going to use to time your 24-hour endurance races. For anyone out there who has a Daytona and needs to do it, this is the watch for you. <laughs> it's worth noting as well, um, we're seeing redesigned subdials. So one of my personal gripes with the, with the Daytona, as I mentioned, mm. the, the subdials with the, the surrounds, yeah. here we're seeing a full panda dial. And there's a little bit of a hint to the classic exotic dials mm. that we saw in old Rolex Daytonas. So all the manual wine Daytonas um, from the 6239, the first reference um, of the redesigned watch, came with what was officially called exotic dials, yeah. both in black and sort of a creamy off-white um, background. Mm-hmm. They uh, today are often referred to as Paul Newman dials, um, as, of course, Paul Newman famously had an exotic dial, which was yeah. gifted to him by his wife, Joanne Woodward. And uh, she gave him one of these watches. He wore it for wore it at Le Mans. Wore also a Accutron, by the way, at Le Mans, um, and a handful yeah. of other watches. Yeah, he um, he had quite a fan of Accutrons. Um, but anyway, the Daytona is definitely his most famous watch. And yeah. a few years ago, his personal Paul Newman's Paul Newman sold, um, setting auction records, um, and is uh, is still a blue chip uh, collectible vintage yeah. Rolex, even after the vintage market has settled a little bit. Yeah, it has. And but like Daytona's man, people. 
love them. They froth them. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so what we're seeing here, and, and Rolex as a brand don't do homage and they don't do vintage. It would be so easy for Rolex to just re-release uh, a Paul Newman dial. Yeah. Could happen tomorrow. They're not going to do it. They're never going to do it because Rolex is about moving forward. But interestingly, on the subdials here, we are seeing a little bit of a nod to the Paul Newman and the exotic dials in yeah. those subdials. Whilst they don't have the same typeface, that's changed. It's still classic Daytona, modern Daytona typeface. Mm -hmm. We are seeing the same little sticks with the with the the square markers on the end. So mm -hmm. there's clearly a little bit of a nod to to this. Maybe this is sort of like a uh, a Rolex Daytona greatest hits, kind of like. Porsche do with the 911 Sports Classics, cherry picking pieces from classic Porsche, in this case from classic Daytona, and putting them on this watch to make a celebratory watch. Yeah, no, I could totally see that happening, but yeah, we'll we'll see. Open case back as well on this one. That is that is very cool because it looks gorgeous through that exhibition case back. <laughs> totally. Is this Rolex now making a statement that future? precious metal Daytonas, because before it was just the platinum, now it's the white gold, as this is a white gold watch. Are precious metal Daytonas now going to feature a display case back? Maybe. I mean, it would suggest it, right? I mean, it's white gold, exhibition case back. What are you going to... Yeah, I would, I would say so. Yeah. I mean, they're showing off a new movement and a, and a custom movement in this, yeah. um, which we're not seeing in any other watch. Well, I would, would be kind of, not useless, but kind of pointless, I guess, mm. like to have that 24-hour subtitle. Ah, well, I guess it could work, but... Yeah, I mean, can't blame them. Ro Ro Rolex yeah. are doing amazing work, so if they're going to show off their handiwork yeah. um, and they're going to brag about it, who's going to stop them? They're still going to be unobtainable, and this watch is going to be absolutely unobtainable. It hasn't released yet, has it? I believe a few started hitting uh, boutiques. Um, there was a hands-on article I, I read just the other day, uh -huh. so they are hitting boutiques by the looks of things. Mm -hmm. None have appeared on the secondary market. Okay. When they do... 100,000 US, 200,000, it doesn't matter at this how much, point. How much are they going for now? Or is it a price on request? Uh, is, is, it, is it in the 50s US? I believe, oh uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, 51,400 US uh, dollars. US dollars. Yeah. So uh, 51,400 US dollars. Unfortunately, that knocks that off my Chrissy present list. Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I mean, regardless, uh, I don't think anyone but, the, but Rolex is number one clients yeah, so are VIPs, be, right. yeah, no one's going to get this watch um yeah. when they do show up on the secondary market undoubtedly they will what they go for is anyone's guess i don't really think it matters honestly people will pay whatever they're prepared to pay for this yeah absolutely they already pay stupid amounts for daytona's at auction like i mean we talked about the paul newman's one record breaking i don't see in a few years this being record breaking just because of the unique features that it has on it yeah yeah definitely especially if this movement is ends up being like exclusive to this watch I, I don't see this rolling out in any other uh, Daytona. I obviously can't speak for Rolex. Um, <laughs> I, I do not work for Rolex. Oh. Um, uh, however, it, it kind of wouldn't make sense. No, it no, wouldn't it make, sense, make this, sense this to roll out in anything except for this special edition, which is yeah. celebrating a 24-hour race. Mm. How long do we reckon this will stay in the catalogue for? I reckon only a year. Yeah, I can't imagine it'll be much, much longer than that, unless they, uh, unless they sell them out in stupid amount of time like three months six months or something but i just can't see that happening i don't believe this is a limited edition it's not a limited edition no well rolex don't really do limited editions okay. they, they don't really do numbered watches i'm just used to every time like some sort of celebrated what like celebratory watch comes out it's always a limited edition limited to 100 pieces 200 <laughs> yeah. pieces yeah. i thought it would be 100 pieces 100 anniversary like heaps of brands do that it would make sense yeah. um it's not really rolex's way yeah i think this will stay in the catalog for one year and then be very quietly taken out yeah and it makes sense this is a celebratory watch for 100 years of Le Mans next year will be 101 so this really wouldn't have a place in the collection yeah I yeah they'll probably remove it just before the next year's Le Mans probably. exactly yeah. and Rolex don't really do special limited watches mm. obviously in their vintage lineup when you go back to you know 41 13 um, split second chronographs there's 12 of those in the world you've got the Jean-Claude Achilles you've got the um, Padalones there's all of these vintage chronographs that are or vintage watches I should say that are in extremely limited numbers, simply because that's all they were selling at the time. Yeah. Rolex don't do that today. Yeah. They, they mass produce watches. Yeah, they do. This one will be made at scale. It's not a limited watch. I'm mm -hmm. sure they'll make fewer than yeah, the no, than the other Daytonas naturally, but this is not something that we're gonna we're gonna see um, limited to a certain number. And that's not something Rolex does. However, I reckon this is this is the collectible watch from the modern Rolex era. It has to be. Well, uh, what else uh, comes absolutely. close? Absolutely. No, I can't even think of anything off the top of my head. Maybe 
Oh, maybe what was the what was the watch with the with the um, emojis and the the balloons and stuff that they showed off at, at Watches and Wonders? The day date. The day date. Yeah. yeah. The I think that yeah the the, the day date with the emojis. It's yeah. again that's. Probably, yeah, the the only other thing that springs to mind. Um, yeah, as, as a collector's yeah. watch, yeah. Rainbow Daytonas, but that's a that's a whole different style of watch. And yeah. the Rainbow Daytona and the and the, the emoji sort of fall into the same category, which is something more on the dressier side. Obviously, the, the Daytona is a tool watch, but they're available in, only available in precious metals, and I don't really think anyone's going to the racetrack with a chronograph covered in a gradient sapphire <laughs> bezel and timing, watches, uh, t- timing races. That ain't happening. I, I don't think that's yeah. the reason they're buying them, no. <laughs> so in the sports line, up this has to be the only, only thing that comes to mind of, of a collectible modern rolex um whether or not we we see these continuing and setting record prices for the for the model for modern pieces in the future that's up does i we were talking about this off camera you know ferrari is a bit of they're kind of nowhere in in f1 well they're not nowhere they're in the top four top five you know top five mid table mid yeah they really they started strong last year. We thought they were, you know, they were world champion runners up, but this year it's just kind of not going anywhere. Um, do you? And there have been comments that they'll move now to endurance racing because I've heard that one is just because they're winning. I don't think that's a good reason, but it is a reason. But two, it's it's better advertising for their cars that you know their road cars, which ultimately is what all this racing stuff is. It's not what it's about, but it definitely helps you sell cars when you're winning races. Race on Sunday, sell on Monday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Goes back to it. But he Ferrari won for the first time since 1965. And while everyone's stoked about that, the first question people ask is, are they going to now focus more on endurance racing than F1? Which is so not fair, in, in my opinion. What do you think? <laughs> I, yeah, congratulations, Ferrari. No easy feat to win a 24-hour race um, and out of nowhere. No, yeah. And they did. it didn't... I mean, they looked good during the race, but there were a few mistakes. And like Toyota, as always, are strong. They won, what, last four years in a row? I believe so, yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's great. But that's, and this is why I don't think it's a big deal for Ferrari to do both. Because Ferrari fans, we love a comeback. (laughs) We lost our minds over this Le Mans win. It was, what, 58 years. And it's been 16 years since their last F1 championship. When that goes off, sales and cheers, it'll go through the roof. <laughs> Everyone will go nuts. It's the old proverb of, yep, race on Sunday, sell on Monday. Absolutely. Yeah. Nothing sells better than a comeback. Absolutely nothing. That's for sure. Yeah. So uh, we, we spoke off camera of, uh, of how, is this Ferrari's move away from F1 and towards endurance? Or is this Ferrari ideally dominating both endurance and F1. They're never leaving F1. They have been there since the beginning. It is part of not only their own identity, but F1's identity. Like, I think Toto Wolff said, uh, it was early 2021, you know, the last time Ferrari were doing well, (laughs) Um, that when Ferrari does well, Formula One does well. Because people know about Ferrari and Formula One, even if it is just Michael Schumacher, that's valuable. That's what's on people's minds. Go far, you know. Why are Ferraris red? Because when little boys draw a race car, it's red. It, red goes faster. It's been a proverb since bloody primary school, and it's that it stands true today. <laughs> it's it's intrinsic. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> and and endurance racing is is fantastic. It's seen a little bit of a of more interest. Um, obviously after the Ford versus Ferrari film with um the Bale, yeah. Christian Bale and Matt Damon, the yeah. James Mangold film. Um, fantastic film and sh- shown a shone a huge light on on endurance racing. It absolutely did. I wasn't even familiar with the um, uh, the Ford GT40 taking over from Ferrari at that point. 1965. It was in 66 that for Ford won. That's when the movie set. 1966, the first year that Ford won at Le Mans with yeah. the GT40. Yeah, there you go. And it's in, and for how, what was that like five peri- five years of dominance from Ford after that? I think it was three years, and they won again a fourth time after a year off. I believe. Don't, don't quote me on that. Um, but they, they for a period they absolutely dominated at Le Mans, mm. and that was the last time prior. That was the last time that Ferrari won at Le Mans with yeah. the with the two fifty LM. It's a, I always find it funny that a lot of movies based around Ferrari are always from the perspective of someone trying to beat Ferrari, but it almost ignores my, most of Ferrari's history where they're not winning. <laughs> Pretty much. And I think uh, F- Ferrari were definitely on board with, with, the, with Ford versus Ferrari film. I, it's, out, it's 
I think some of the scenes in that and some of the cars they had access to, mm. um, it's clear that that was a film that was at least had the blessing oh, from, yeah. uh, the, from Modena. There's a level of respect to Ferrari in that, even if it is from the perspective of Ford, like, you know, we're rooting for, for Ford to finally beat the Ferrari, but... You, you know, they're not beating them because... Also, we're getting a little off topic here. <laughs> so the old proverb is that when Ferrari is doing well in Formula One, the road cars are terrible. And when Ferrari is doing terrible in Formula One, the road cars are fantastic. And at the moment, as as we've said, Ferrari are sort of mid-table. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, we'll get to the we'll get to Ferrari later in F1. Definitely. Yeah. We have seen a new uh, a new Ferrari just uh, just drop though, mm. and this is the SF ninety XX Stradale. Yeah, it's a car that you don't particularly like, but fan like well, I don't know if they're fans, but enthusiasts have been all up in arms about this. People love it. I've been reading the comments; they've been all over it. People are in love. Yeah, people really like it. They, I think they're just, I think they're just stoked that it's you know essentially a track car, but it's road legal. Definitely. Yeah. So this is the first Ferrari XX car that is road legal. Yeah. And Ferrari's a bit of a history with these cars. So we've, of course, had the, the FXX based on the Enzo 599XX, based on the 599 GTO, mm -hmm. and the FXXK based on the LaFerrari. Yeah. These were track-exclusive Ferraris. These were not road legal. Mm -hmm. And most of the case, these were not owned by individuals. They were technically owned by the factory or kept by the factory. Mm -hmm. And Ferrari would let you race it or drive it at racetracks yeah. if and when they felt like it. I'm sure you had a little bit more say of it than that if you were an owner. Yeah. Um, ludic ludicrously expensive um, mm. and focused just on the track. Yeah. Of course, we've had track focused but road legal uh, Ferrari cars in the past. Um, 458 Speciale, um, mm. et cetera, et cetera. The 360 Challenge Shudali. Yeah. Um, we've seen this before. This is the first road car that's an XX. So is this changing the nomenclature? Is Ferrari now offering a step above mm. the traditional Stradales and the yeah. traditional um, Speciales that's road legal? Are we going to see a track exclusive version beyond this? Mm. I can't. Look, I think, I guess it depends, honestly, on how well this does. I know it's limited and stuff like that, but it, given the reaction of people and how excited everyone is, I think it might be a little bit of like a, it's a, you know, track put, you know, track built but road legal and that might be what the xx stands for now i don't know what, what, what do you think well it's sold out for one. Oh yeah, yeah so these were i think these were sold out before they were even announced um, that wouldn't surprise yeah. me <laughs> and we're looking at a spider version as well yeah. so we i think numbers are 799 coupes and 599 spiders um 840 us for the coupe thousand dollars um 932 000 us for the spider yeah. um if any of these came to Australia, of course, these are going to be both well over a million dollars. Um, we'll see if any came to Australia. It'll be interesting to see them on the roads if they're able to be registered here. I'm sure someone will get around it. Yeah. Um, interesting. It's powerful. Go oh boy! Really powerful. Let's let's just let's just list off some of the some of those specs. Oh, the juicy specs. Yeah, we've got a twin turbo V8, zero to hundred kilometers uh, in two point three seconds. <laughs> which is 0.2% fa uh, seconds faster than the regular SF90. Not only that, 0 to 200 kilometers an hour in 6.5 seconds. 786 horsepower, which is 17 more than the regular. You got an extra boost feature with the electric motors taking the total up to 1,016 horsepower. It's a monster. <laughs> and I think you, you preferred to the boost feature of this as a Mario Kart button. Oh, yeah, yeah. You've got the, in, in the qualifying mode on the car, you've got a boost feature. You get extra power 30 times in, like, just a, a, around the track, which does that not sound like a mushroom for Mario Kart? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Um, so is, is this backed by the electric motors? Yes, yes. So I think all that extra power is coming from those electric motors. And you're draining the battery to get the extra power. Yeah, that's why you can only do it, like, over one lap. You get 30 in a lap, and I think then you've drained the battery. And I think that's part of the F1 um, technology, with the hybrid technology where they charge the battery to use later. And we'll see exclusive use of that feature on the track and down Double Bay. <laughs> yeah, probably. The yeah. only two places you're going to see that feature being used. <laughs> um, in, look, you you alluded to it, to, to it before. This mm. I I'm not too big of a fan of this car. Yeah. One, I think it's it's a weird change of uh, of, of their models sequence. 
to do a road legal XX car. Yeah. Um, it's just a, it's a confusing situation. Um, yeah. And it will confuse some uh, Ferrari fans, maybe some clients. Um, I don't really think they're too stressed about that. No. Um, my real gripe with this is it looks like a dog's dinner. See, I don't actually, I, I don't like it in the silver with the, with the I do like the orange X, S ducts and stuff like that. But the red one with the red and black uh, contrast, maybe I just want a red Ferrari, but I think it looks pretty good. It, I think it's it's definitely aggressive. And, it, and I, you, aggressive. You, you can tell it's being styled this way for aero, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Um, there's a fixed rear wing on it. It's got front splitter, it's downforce. Um, uh, the downforce is absolutely insane. It's doubled from the regular SF90. Doubled. It's literally doubled. So all of that aero and probably a few other bits of trickery here and there are doubling the downforce. Yeah. It's understandable why it's shaped the way it is. Mm. And it's a race car. It's, of course, it's not going to be graceful, yeah. but it looks like a Mansori. How are Mansori going to Mansori this thing? Are we going to strap more ducks to it? Maybe. You never know. <laughs> yeah. sure. I mean, you don't know what aerodynamic technology will do. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Um, I, you, you're probably going to hear me gripe about this every every now and then, so yeah. I'll keep it to a minimum. Yeah. Um, but it's it seems like Ferrari is just getting stuck in this trap, and, and maybe Lamborghini as well, mm. um, where they feel like to make the car bigger and better and it's got to be it's got to be more than the previous that a way we do that from a design perspective is we just put more angles on the car right and it's just becoming complex and it's losing some of the grace that you've seen in some of the other cars like the roma and the 296 oh, absolutely am i an old man am i just an old man about this maybe maybe this is what the kids want yeah. obviously for from an aerodynamic perspective it's good it's, it's getting the performance yeah. out of the car yeah. Yeah. we can see why it's purpose-built yeah. but could it be done and look a little bit more graceful yeah Oh no, I agree with you. It's not my favorite Ferrari that they've ever put out. Not even close, really. But I, I, you know, just those specs alone. Well, we don't have like a time, like a lap time. I don't think yet. Well, look, we'll see. But uh, I don't know. Like, it's not a. I'm more of like a F40 California kind of guy. Which yeah. I, I don't know if that's sacrilege. <laughs> California is an interesting choice. The 250 or the more recent one. Uh, the uh, yeah the two fifty two fifty yeah yeah stunning stunning shape yeah I, I think I think for me that's just because I like how that car looks <laughs> oh, I've seen I've seen a, a handful in person and they live up to it that's for sure I've sat sat in, in one being driven in one it's just it's a yeah incredible shape totally different sort of Ferrari um th this it, it is a yeah. very different kind of Ferrari it's interesting to see that they did a spider. That's something I did not expect. And when I first yeah. saw this drop, I didn't realize there was a spider. It took me having to look this one up and, and, and read a press release to yeah. go, oh, there's a there's a spider. I wouldn't have even considered they would have done this. When you do a track-focused car, why would you be making a convertible? Well, I guess it's to show off that soundtrack or something. Yeah, it's probably... Make sure that toupee flies off. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> of all the midlife crisis owners. Absolutely. <laughs> That's the way. Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting car. As, as we said, these are all sold out. Um, it would be cool to see a proper track only, as in non-road registrable version, yeah. down the line. The SF90 is a really cool platform. Mm. Um, I think it's a good-looking car in in standard spec. Yeah. Um, whether or not we see one that like it more close to you know a 458 GT3, mm. something like that that maybe is not even available to the public. Yeah, okay. To see what is possible to get out of this powertrain and this platform would be really cool because this is, of course, going to be kneecapped a little bit by the fact that it has to be road registered. This isn't as much as what this car can do. It's true. Yeah, yeah. They definitely have to pull back at least a little bit. Maybe we should jump to the next topic. And this is something that I think has shocked all of us. Daniel Ricciardo is returning as a driver to Formula One. Yeah. Mate, give us the breakdown. Far out. Okay. I thought Daniel Ricciardo was never coming back to the grid. I thought he was going to be a media personality because doesn't that just make sense? It's Daniel Ricciardo. He's so marketable. He's so smiley. So everyone loves him, you know? Mm. No one wants to see him leave the sport. So make him a commentator or, or, or some sort of correspondent, something, you know, something in the media. Martin but, Brundle. Exactly. You know? Just follow in the footsteps of Martin Brundle. Not that he's going anywhere. Don't want him to No, no, anywhere. absolutely. <laughs> never. We, we need much. We need, we need many more awkward track walks. Oh, it's golden. <laughs> But yeah, so Daniel Ricciardo's back. He's racing for AlphaTauri. He was uh, Red Bull's reserve driver after he got axed from McLaren. Well, he got paid $22 million to not race for McLaren. So, you know, he cries with his millions. <laughs> but now he's back. And I found it very strange because when he left, he said he didn't want to race for anyone other than a top team. But realistically, there's no seats available at any of the top teams. And by top teams, I mean... Red Bull, Mercedes, Ferrari. Aston. 
Well, Aston this year, but that was a surprise. I don't think when he said those comments late last year that he was talking about Aston Martin. Yeah, definitely not. <laughs> but I'm sure he would now. Um, but, you know, Fernando Alonso's not going anywhere yet, and we know Lance Stroll's not going anywhere. So he's he's at Alpha Tauri. So he said he wouldn't want to race at, for a midfield team. And now he's racing for maybe the slowest team on the grid this year. And it's very, very interesting. Maybe it's just been a snap back to reality that if he wants to get back on the grid, he just has to prove that he's still got it. And if he doesn't race, like if, so he's, this is, we filmed before, we filmed this before he's raced at Hungary this weekend. So we don't know if he has pace, but if he can't match Yuki Sonoda in the same machinery, I think that's his career over. What does this mean for him, for his future? If he can, if he can do this, he will. Um, if he, you know, if he can at least match Yuki Sonoda or do better, I'm sure he's hoping to do better. But Yuki is very fast this year. Um, he will. I mean, he'll just stay as a driver. He he could stay at AlphaTauri for the foreseeable future until something opens up. You never know what's going to happen in Formula One. They call it silly season for a reason. Not that we've hit that yet, but you never know wh who's going to leave, what kind of shifts that's going to entail. So. As much as I'd love to be able to say, I know exactly where Daniel Ricciardo is going. I didn't think he was going to end up back on the grid. So clearly, I don't know anything. <laughs> but like, what do, you, what do you think? Like, are you into it? Or like, are you just kind of as an observer? <laughs> Ricciardo is fantastic. Yeah. I think he's he's been a, a real entry point for a lot into the sport. Because he's such a great media personality. He's a cool guy. Everyone cool guy. everyone loves him. He does. Yeah. To see him back is, is awesome. Um, imagine if he'd replaced Verstappen. <laughs> not not even like well, he left Red Bull because not not going to happen. Yeah, he left Red Bull because he didn't want to be the number 2 to Max Verstappen. Yeah. So I mean, and now he says he's more than happy to take the Red Bull seat, but imagine yeah. next week we're sitting here talking about him beating Verstappen at Hungary. So I mean, it's not going to happen. It's not <laughs> going to happen. <laughs> I would be shocked. The world would, would be shocked. Yeah, that would be a proper upset. Cuz Red Bull are bringing upgrades this weekend, so if they're even further ahead of everyone or at least Max Verstappen is even further ahead of everyone, man. I don't, I don't think even the bold and the beautiful writers could have uh, written, a, <laughs> written a twist like that. <laughs> They're taking notes from F1. They're watching every, every Grand Prix. <laughs> yeah, oh, this is useful. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, like sand through the hourglass. <laughs> um, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. It's going to be an interesting weekend to see him back in the car. Absolutely. And, of course, everyone listening is probably already aware of what's going to happen. Yeah, but no, we're sitting here as an observer of where the, he hasn't yeah, yet Yeah, feel free to let us know in the comments how, how much of an uh, idiot we are. <laughs> Should we place bets? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's make some predictions. Okay, where's he gonna place? Where's he gonna place? I think he'll place optimistically. I reckon around P thirteen. P thirteen. Because he's driving a tractor for starters, and Yuki barely. I think he's got two points. Um, from what? How, how many races are we in now? I don't know. There's too many this year. <laughs> I've lost track. Yeah. Um. But it's just. It's more so the machinery than his skill. I don't think I'll be. Ve I don't think he'll be at the back of the grid. I think he has too much to prove. Even I, optimistically, I think he will push that thing as far as it can go. Best case scenario, P10 gets a point. But oh, yeah. I think realistically, it'll be between the P13, P15 mark. He's going to grab the nuts off it. I mean, what choice does he have? Exactly. Yeah. He's he's driving for his life. He's driving to survive. You might say. You could say <laughs> absolutely. Um, so your prediction is is P13. Yeah. Who do you predict that Brundle's going to have his awkward moment with on track this weekend? I don't know. Not a lot of celebrities seem to go to Hungary. <laughs> so I, I don't know who will run Hungary. into. Yeah, I don't think it's Hungary's fault. I just, I just don't think it's the most glamorous race. Like, we see a lot of celebrities at Silverstone because, you know, up the road from London and so on. And then at, at a lot of the American races because, again, a lot of these big stars are American or at least based there. And then at Monaco because that's the crown jewel. So Hungary is just, for lack of a better word, just another track on the just grid. Just another track. I love this track, by the way. I'm not throwing shade. Oh, but in great. terms of like people who aren't necessarily into Formula One re religiously, that's not the race they're going to visit. This is more than likely the one that, of course, not the true fans. They're always going to watch everything, the, yeah. the, the, the diehards. But this is yeah. the one that I guess we're going to see a little bit of a people tuning out on. Yeah, probably. Uh, I. It's not... There aren't that many narratives going on right now. Well, actually, I think a lot of people will tune in for Daniel Ricciardo. I think probably right, actually, yeah. I, I think people will want to see how he's going, how he's doing. Is he all right? <laughs> we'll find out. Hopefully he doesn't cry. Yeah. Yeah. 
Let's hope that was it. Was actually heartbreaking watching him. It was. I honestly, I, I feel, I feel sorry for him. He's a, he's a, yeah. he's a lovely guy. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't deserve, he didn't deserve it. Um, and the, you know, the media, you know, heap onto him. That was unfair, but that's the nature of the game, isn't it? <laughs> well, he's given a second chance, and as you said, obviously, he's he's been kneecapped in this car. Yeah. Um, but it's going to be an interesting weekend. A hundred percent, hundred percent. That's for sure. And our final topic is something very close to your heart. It is. Yeah. So you want to? You want to? I'll let you run run through this. Absolutely. So, um, to give you a little bit of background of, of why this story really struck a chord with me, um, I, I grew up in in uh, around Clo Valley, um, swimming every single day, pretty much. So a watch that can jump in the water with me, definitely not an Accutron, <laughs> that's for sure. The from sixty years ago, a watch that can jump in the water with me, be it a my um, you know Seiko uh, Turtle SKX or an Aorus or uh, a Tudor Black Bay Thirty Six. Um, a, a watch that can get in the water with me is is something that's always going to be in my collection because I'm in pretty much every single day, even through winter, not going to stop me. And we saw a few, a, a, probably a few months ago now, um, Matt Cuddy, a professional surfer and diver um, in Noosa, post on his social media, out he was out um, for a dive, collecting up sea debris, he was getting surfboard fins and nets and other, other rubbish out of the ocean, and found a Rolex Submariner. You know, just another bit of rubbish. Just another <laughs> bit of rubbish, or some might say that. Um, initially, he thought it was a barley knockoff, and I mean, you can't really, I mean, can't blame him. Yeah, um, I, would, I would have thought the exact same. Yeah, thing. the chances <laughs> of pulling a pulling a sub out of the ocean is is pretty rare. Yeah. Um, specifically, it's fifty five thirteen. Um, it does also have a service bezel, a service dial, I should say. Um, you can see it's got white gold surrounds on it. Fifty five thirteen's been a vintage reference. Were flat matte dials without surrounds, so. When you look at it, that might be initially. If you, I mean, if you know your submarine as well, you may be thrown off a little bit by that. So, mm-hmm. clarifying what's going on there, it's just had a service dial put in. Yeah. Um, it was on a Velcro strap yep. when he pulled it out, and it was covered in barnacles. Yeah, it looked very funky. It looked like like something you found out of the Lost World, you know, out of Atlantis. A because, shipwreck. Yeah, a shipwreck. <laughs> Bloody shipwreck watch. Um, so, so Matt pulls it out and posts on his Instagram story of day he found what was it, like five surf fins. And and a Rolex, <laughs> and and uh, naturally, as as someone and Matt Matt is not a watch guy. I think quite clearly, um, yeah. can't speak for him, but I, I just don't, he's not in the same depths that we are. Ha ha, depths. No pun intended. <laughs> um, he was much deeper than all of us, but not the watch world. Um, so so the watch world goes insane when this pops up. We've seen a few Rolexes get pulled out of the deep yeah. um, over the years, but this is this is the first one in in quite a few years now. Um, it does happen on occasion. So the watchword goes mental. Matt's yeah. getting calls left, right, uh, Instagram DMs from collectors yeah. trying to trying to get it, um, probably offering stupid money. Matt sits down and just goes, "No, I'm only going to give this back to the original owner," and wants to go and find yeah. the owner, which is which is fantastic. He could have just pocketed it. Well, the, yeah, he absolutely could have. And a lot of the people that were messaging him were messaging him saying, "No, that's my watch." And they'd had no proof or anything like that exactly right there was an engraving on the case back i think which was the which was the key and he didn't post about that no he didn't um however the watch uh, press did pick it up and uh, henry zwartz who, who henry's a, a good friend of mine um mm-hmm. lives locally we, we swim all the time uh, down at clovelly um he wrote an article for fratello where he's one of their one of their contract yeah. writers um talking about this watch just documenting the story yeah. um this is before this is basically this up to the point where it had just been posted online and being shared around with a watch world of, wow, a, a sub has just come out of the depths. Um, unbelievable. And just last week, we saw a follow-up story, oh, yeah. which is amazing. Um, it's rare that we'd see a happy ending on a story like this, but yeah. amazingly, we have. Yeah, they he found the original owner. They, he found him. They reached out. He detailed the inscription and the serial number. It was like, that's my watch. And it's been sorted out, hasn't it? It has. It's it's on its way home. It's on its way home through Rolex, who are going to yeah. be doing a, uh, I think a, a a considered restoration. The watch was still running when it was pulled out of the water. Yeah, Incredibly, yeah. he, he said, said it was a bit chunky trying to wind it though because <laughs> of all the sand. <laughs> like, that bezel's probably seen better days. That's yeah. for sure. Um, it's it had spent four years in the drink. Yeah, amazing. The fact that it's still running. Hats off to Rolex for that. Yeah. In salt water and everything. In salt water. Um, the original owner, whose name is, is Rick, uh, put a comment on Henry's story on Fratello. Mm. It's basically saying, if it's got this inscription on the back, 
it's mine. Yeah. Um, Henry has then made the connection between uh, between Matt, the gentleman who founded the Surfer, and mm. Rick, the original owner. Yeah. And funny enough, they only apparently live uh, within you know I think a twenty minute drive, something like that. It was like from each kilometers other. from each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, not far at all. In Queensland. In, yeah, up in Noosa. Um, so they've been uh, reconnected, and the watch is it's going going home. Apparently, Rick lost it uh, while surfing. Uh, he he thinks his his leg rope must have just caught the Velcro strap, yeah. and it just flew off his wrist when he was trying to you know maybe paddle to get onto a wave. <laughs> didn't notice. Yeah. Only when he got back to the car and. His wetsuit did he go oh it's gone it's gone yeah because it's not the first time he lost it either that's why it was on a velcro strap but he um he dropped it in the sewage tank as well the septic tank oh the septic tank the that's septic what it tank. was exactly and <laughs> um, apparently he was, he was helping a maid install one in his backyard back when septic tanks were a thing obviously yeah. thank god we don't have them anymore um i hope but i think, oh, my, I think my parents still do <laughs> <laughs> well check it for rolexes <laughs> should um, because uh, Rick, Rick took, took the watch off, put it in his top pocket, mm. um, and was apparently leaning over it, and he reckoned mm. fell into it. He didn't realise. Only when they were finished uh, doing the job um, did he realise that it had fallen out of the pocket. Yeah. Um, this is why you should always put, put buttons or, or some <laughs> form. If you're going to put your watch aside, you know, make sure it's not going to end up in a septic tank. Um, they searched the yard, couldn't find it. Um, they didn't assume that it had landed in the septic tank. Yeah, that's a pretty weird well, place for it to, to go yeah. um and two years later when they were clearing it out um did did rick's mate uh find the watch yeah. um apparently he kept the bracelet he which... did keep the bracelet that's why he put it on velcro <laughs> so he took the bracelet put it on his tutor submariner yeah uh from a similar reference uh similar vintage and uh and yeah rick put it on a, a velcro and just put it back on his wrist and oh, i'm hope he gave it a clean <laughs> And you, just kept, you would imagine he did. <laughs> you know, it was a stinky watch. Um, and then went surfing with it. So it, it's been lost and found once before. Yeah. And it is incredible to see it going home. It's interesting as well because I, I don't I, I can't speak for Rick, mm. the uh, the original owner, naturally. Yeah. Um, however, it doesn't seem like he's a watch guy. This was a gift for him to him f- from his father, I believe, in the 70s. Yeah. And it seems like he's developed such a life doing things with this watch. It's just been a companion for him. Yeah, if you read the article, he has done been through so many adventures and seen so much country with this watch on his wrist, whether it's from yachting, skiing, all these all these activities, that watch has been with him since the 70s, since his dad gave it to him. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll link the article in the bio yeah. uh, down below. However, yeah, it's been with him for, for all, all this time. I, I urge everyone to, to, to read it for sure. Um, it's... It's a watch that clearly has some sentimental value. We read oh, in the yeah. article, and I'll, I'll paraphrase it, but when he found out that it had been found and it was matching Cyril, it was his watch. I believe he found out uh, from his his daughter told him or family member told him while they were sitting around having dinner, and he said he, he, I'll paraphrase him, he said he could not stay at the table. He got up, walked outside, yeah. leant against a, a garden post and, and, and cried. That goes to show that even, even though I don't think he's a watch guy, mm-hmm. he's had such a life with this companion piece and built up such a connection yeah. to it. Whether or not he realised, it may have been subconscious. Yeah. It's the power of watches as a, as a as a as a a companion and as a little talisman to store stories of your life in. Yeah, it, it's it's a testament to the longevity of these things. You know, we we're used to so many things. You know, you buy it, you use it for a year or two, you throw it, like a phone. You know, you're always ready for an upgrade, even if you shouldn't <laughs> even if you shouldn't yeah but like a watch is it it isn't really like that yeah you can replace and buy more watches but it doesn't like it's not going to stop something like, as well built as a rolex submariner from like not working for as long as you need it to as long as you, you know take some care of it but it's just like i personally have never had that kind of emotional attachment to an object like none of my watches um have been I had I do have one watch that I keep at home like my, I keep that in my parents safe that's something they got got me for my um my confirmation communion when I was a kid it doesn't fit me anymore <laughs> because the links are tiny <laughs> like that bracelet is so small but that's the closest thing I got and this article was really an epiphany where it's like you don't even need to be a watch guy for for these kinds of attachments to to occur with watches and it's what you were saying before it's those power the power of watches. And it, I think part of that is because of that longevity. They aren't disposable. They are, you know, you buy it, it's yours. How, what, what you do with it is up to you. Absolutely. And it kind of, speaking of what you do with it, yeah. it's kind of funny to, to see people treating submariners, sea dwellers, hmm. really any Rolex tool watch, any, any tool watch, doesn't have to be a Rolex, yeah. with a white glove treatment. Yeah. It's kind of ludicrous. When you look at this thing, it spent four years around saltwater, 
bumping up against rocks, having, you know, bloody, uh, uh, what were they? Like little like mollusks, mollusks or, or, or something, something was something, growing on it. <laughs> something is growing on this watch. It's, it's now become a, an artificial reef, yeah. probably. Um, and it's still ticking. They can go through hell. Someone else has banged up a Rolex yeah. much more than you ever could. So on, is this cooler than, than you know, an unworn 5513 with with original unpolished uh, uh, case and yeah. a, original dial instead of a service dial. This has got the story. I prefer this one. It's I not, and I don't want it. It's not my watch. Obviously, no, 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 it, sh- no, yeah. it should be with, with, with Rick, the original owner. Absolutely. But this has got such a better story and so much more emotional sentiment to it. And after reading stuff like this, it, it just makes you realize, like, you don't, it's what you said, you don't have to have the white glove treatment with your watch, especially a tool watch. They, to, you know, Rolex was building these things at a time when smartphones were, weren't a thing and they actually needed to survive these conditions that they were being put through. Yeah, it was a tool. It, 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 was, it like, was the actual tool. <laughs> yeah, a bezel is, that to time you dive or you yeah. surf or whatever or your lunch break is yeah. like an app. Yeah. It's just like an app. <laughs> <laughs> Old timey apps. <laughs> exactly, because it was it was a, just a tool. It was something that you yeah. needed to do for, for your life. It wasn't. Yeah. It, I mean, of course, they're, they're still they're still Rolexes are still fantastic uh, tools. Don't get me wrong, yeah. but they are they have ascended beyond. I mean, could you imagine someone treating their Makita drill like? <laughs> well, that's that's kind of how I thought. Like about like it. people treat modern Rolexes. Go down to Bunnings and see if you can get little plastic covers yeah. to put o- over your drill so you don't scratch it up and it holds its resale value. I mean, come on, these are tools. Let's use them. Yeah, exactly. And clearly, I, I hope we see this back on Rick's wrist in the surf. And Rick, if you're listening, put on a NATO strap. Anyone who's surfing with your watch <laughs> or doing anything where it's going to be in trouble, put it on a NATO strap because if you lose a spring bar. It's not going anywhere. You're not going to be able to pull it off pull with off, a, yeah. a like a Velcro strap. So yeah. if, if you are doing something like this with your watch, take care of it, obviously. But don't baby them. Yeah, absolutely not. And well, who knows? Maybe we'll have a little bit of a little bit of something something related to this coming up in the future. Who knows? Yes, maybe we'll, we'll <laughs> hopefully there's a part three on this when the watches get reunited. Yeah. Um, it's wonderful to see that Rick and Matt have become friends. Yeah. It seems like a friendship is blossoming. It's what Henry mentions in the article, yeah. which is wonderful. Um, I'm sure we'll see a part three and maybe we'll hear f- something from Henry soon. Yeah, um, absolutely. Well, thank you guys for listening. That's all we have time for today. If anything, we've actually gone a little over time. <laughs> Just a touch. <laughs> Just a touch. But thank you guys for listening to the 10 Pieces of 8 podcast. If you want to find us uh, just on all the socials at 10 Pieces of 8 or hit up the 10 Pieces of 8 website for all watch news, car-related news, F1 news, all that sort of good stuff. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.